Mike uh, did me a solid and gave me a very good segue regarding the expandable technology portion of CAGES. And so what Mike said earlier is very important. Mike and I went to college together at Stanford. We also did our residencies together. So I've known Mike since we're like 19 years old. And one of the things Mike has always impressed me about, and we used to talk about a lot in residency when we were sitting around waiting around, we'd like play Super Nintendo in the call room and stuff like that together, is we would say stuff like, you know, the thing about surgery is like the people who are fast go slow. And that's a weird statement, right? Because anybody who's ever played sports in their life knows that you go slower to become faster. Like in baseball, in football, uh, swimming, running, it's always the same. It's optimization of all the individual steps. So just like Mike was showing, and then the question I asked, for example, when Mike was talking about out, awake and like you know, the wonderful talk you just heard about awake of surgery, it's really an optimization of the steps, right? You have to implement all these technologies, the endoscope, the workflow, how do you target the pedicle screws, when do you target the pedicle screws, do you put the wires in at the beginning, so on and so forth. So it's, it's like 100, 120 steps per surgery. So CAGE technology represents, just like minimally invasive pedicle screw technology, represents the engineering aspects of how to optimize your workflow. And in this case, for a specific reason and outcome to uh, improve your fusion rates and things like that, but also uh, uh, apropos of like the new emerging concepts of long-term outcome studies, the concept of, uh, let's see, how do you, the concept of, um, the concept of optimizing sagittal balance. Because another thing that we've talked about in terms of long-term outcomes is patient satisfaction. Because now, in the quality of life for your calculations and patient outcomes, what patients perceive in their pain outcomes and their functional return is probably the most important thing. I mean, fusion is important, but if you don't have to revise your screws and there's a pseudoarthrosis and it's asymptomatic, nobody really cares. But people do very much care about their back pain, their ability to walk straight, their uh, ODI scores, and their quality of life. So having that been said, one of the things Things that's really come into play in the last couple of years, particularly from the scoliosis groups and the SRS and, and our European colleagues like Jean Lewick and, and the European study groups, is that sagittal balance or more specifically pelvic parameter lumbar lordosis mismatches are very important because they have significant statistically validated long-term outcomes. Simply put, if people stand straighter and they're looser around their pelvis and they're not hyperextending their hips, people feel better. It's just one of those weird things. You stand relaxed, neutral, you have a better quality of life on a daily basis. So that having said, you extrapolate that, and people say, well, you know, that's important for scoliosis and things like that. But the truth is, if you think about these parameters, they matter no matter what kind of surgery you do, from a discectomy to a single level inner body to a T10 to pelvis. Because you're always, it's like baseball. You, when you're at bat, you always try to hit. You always try to get on base, and ideally you get a double or a triple instead of a single, right? And that's a basic, basic analogy. And so even when doing one level surgery, as part of the new minimally invasive, maximally effective long-term outcome, we're trying to optimize the segmental lordosis of even a one level surgery. And that's what Mike was sort of alluding to of how do you do that when you're doing purely percutaneous, you can't reach in and grab the spine and move it around. We rely on our technologies to achieve segmental correction. It's very, very important because as you know, these parameters and all the papers, and now we have tons of planning software to, to understand where the compensations are, what the pelvic parameter mismatches are. I'm not going to get into that. But you know very well if you've ever been to a NAS meeting or an ISAS meeting or an IMAS meeting, that's all we ever talk about nowadays, right? We talk about the long-term outcomes and ramifications of this. So you want to fine tune your objectives. But the take-home message is even if you're just doing a one-level surgery, people say it's not important. It's totally important because the SRS degenerative databases are now showing even in a one-level degenerative spondy fusion, your segmental correction and your correction of your pelvic tilt, compensatory pelvic tilt, is in some ways the strongest statistical parameter that will predict how that patient does in one and two years and also can predict and significantly influence the incidence of adjacent level and PJKs. So there's no such thing as a one level not important, just fuse them as these latest surgeries. That's completely a flawed way of thinking. And as our databases get stronger and our long-term follow-up gets better, this becomes particularly true. So minimally invasive technologies like expandable cages, people say, why do you even need them? The answer is because as we get more minimally invasive and do awake surgeries like Mike is talking about, I mean, it's difficult to do an awake osteotomy. Like, you're, you know, like Mike said, no bovine, no, but Imagine trying to do PSOs or SPOs or, or Ponte osteotomies on an awake patient. I mean, that's just not going to happen. But the good news is in a lot of our cases, we can rely on technology on the more mobile segments to compensate for us, to allow us to achieve significant lordotic corrections. So 
So, so proper measurements, planning, and again, optimizing each thing so you don't have to do a T10 to pelvis or T4 to pelvis every time, but what you're trying to do is optimize every single level that you're going to do work on, particularly if you're gonna do an inner body at that level. So that's really the balance and the goal. So lordotic correction. So here's a typical case, 52-year-old patient. This is nothing special. Uh, we see a lot of active military where I'm from in LA, and just classic, typical spondy. There's the parameters. You can see the pelvic incidence, pelvic tilt, and the lumbar lordosis uh, uh, at 45. So, so there's not a huge mismatch, but there's a spondy and there's a nine degree thing. So this is not a case of a sagittal balance mismatch, right? The patient's well compensated. But nevertheless, we're about to operate on the person for lumbar stenotic regions. So you can see the cob angle is fairly minor. This is a stenosis spondy case. This is one we all have every day. And a lot of us would normally not think about sagittal balance and pelvic parameters for this kind of case because there's nothing really that wrong in this case. However, a more subtle understanding with like surgeon map and things like that of this case will realize that will make you realize that his upper lumbar spine and thoracic spine are not in whack and his pelvic tilt is a little high for this particular gentleman because he's compensating. So that having been said, we just did the typical T lift that we would normally do. And uh, for those of you who know me, let's see if I have it here. Um, I'm gonna kind of go forward here. I guess, sorry. Um, oh, there it is. We published we published a paper a couple years ago that really summarized um, all our minimally invasive T-lifts over, sorry, I am going the wrong way. Um, summarized all our minimally invasive T-lifts for the last eight, nine years, and we've been doing them since 2003, since the very beginning. And one of the things of our paper that we published in neurosurgical clinics with four-year outcomes in 190 patients was that just like Mike said, there's cost savings and things like that. But unfortunately, when we're doing static cages for a long time, minimally invasive T-lifts, appropriately like Chris Shaffrey and all these people criticized minimally invasive T-lifts because it's kind of a flat back operation. We were getting about three to four degrees of lumbar lordosis uh, on a typical minimally invasive T-lift static cage. And that long-term is suboptimal because we believe that that is not the best thing in the world. So one of the things as we added it to our mix was this concept of using expandable technology just to optimize a single base hit type of operation. And so here you can see a typical water flow of the fluoroscopy. And yeah, that's a lot of fluoro at the beginning. But we put in an expandable trial, expandable cage. And here you can see, as it kind of read like a comic book going across, you can see this is an example of an expandable inner body cage technology where we're achieving that optimal thing. And of course, even in a TLF, this is a awake, uh, not an awake TLF, it's a sleep TLF, but we still do limited pontiosteotomies on both sides because we're putting in screws on both sides so we can see the facets. We take the facets and do limited pontiosteotomies. So there's no way around that particular aspect of it in, in a, like a degenerative spondy like this with bilateral lytic pars fractures. So again, do you do what you have to to achieve anterior height correction, posterior closure, and that's a principle that you can't get away with. But the beauty of the expandable technologies is they now help us simply Simply put, lift from the front. Because it's one thing to drive a wedge in to try to separate them. It would get a lot of subsidence when we used to try to do that. So we would try to avoid to do that. Not to mention, Camden's triangle is very small. So it's hard to get big things in a triangle because you'll bang the DRG, right? We've all been there. The things about expand was like the OptiMesh, it's a wonderful device, seven millimeters in, a bag fill it up, it lifts the anterior column well. And all the technology is fundamentally predicated on that concept. Something small and profile so that it doesn't damage the DRG or the nerve roots dorsally as you go in, lifts up and also ideally expands out to increase the footprint because pressure equals force divided by area, basic physics 101. And the wider your object is, like the Optimesh, the wider these cages are, the more they'll distribute the force and point loading, have less subsidence, and in a perfect world, still allow for ample area for post-filling bone grafting and things like that. So these are the kind of the engineering design parameters of what we would want in a perfect, you know, in a perfect world. So the cages are now iterating towards that. They all have lordotic lifting, expanding, post-fill abilities, and that's what you want. And now with printed titanium technologies and things like that, the materials are becoming relevant as well. So Oh, I'm going backwards again, sorry. This thing. And so there's a perfect example of what this looks like. So 11 millimeter type expandable cage, 10 degrees, and we achieve, you can see it visually, intraoperatively, with small pontiosteotomies, facet osteotomies, we're achieving, or like a Schwab type three osteotomy, we're achieving those kind of cor corrections. So that way, when I leave the OR, I know 
I didn't get three degrees, which is not awesome, but 10 degrees, which is still probably a little low for L4 or 5, but at least it's better than three. And so that's what we've been trying to work towards, and that's why these cases there. And then you can see the final thing. You can see the lumbar lordotic correction. Ultimately, when he stands, goes up about seven degrees, you're like, well, how come it went up seven degrees at lumbar lordosis? Because remember, it's distributed, right? That one level of lordosis is distributed because you gain lumbar lordosis, but you decrease your pelvic tilt, and so the lumbar lordosis winds up being about this, only going up by seven. But you see the segmental correction is still very clear. It's nine degrees uh, at the fixed segment. So that's what we really want. And the biggest thing, his pelvic tilt comes down, which is really what we want. Decrease of pelvic tilt for us and the, a lot of the databases seems to be the most predictive value for one and a half, two years from now of how that patient's going to do. Simply put, he's not retroverting his pelvis anymore. He's looser. Pelvic tilt's going away. And pelvic tilt weirdly goes away over time, right? Because they've been compensating for so long. It doesn't happen the day after surgery. Over rehab, physical therapy, they loosen their hips. They get their butt moving, so to speak. You'll see the lumbar, the pelvic tilt slowly correct over a six-month to nine-month period, depending on how stiff those people's hips are and things like that, which is for the neurosurgeons in the group, one thing that's very important for you to start learning to do if you don't do it already, I'm sure a lot of you do, is to learn from our orthopedic colleagues how to do a good hip exam because people with severe flat back that have arthritis tips, you can do all the surgery till the cows come home, but they won't correct their pelvic tilt and pelvic parameters. And you have to think about that. That's why for a lot of our aged patients with bad hips, we often have them do the hip surgery first, right? And so we talk about that all the time now. So there is the, oh sorry, I keep going backwards. So there is the expandable cage and there's the outcomes I told you about. So again, this is a ref, one of the earliest references that begin to say, hey, you know what? The more residual kyphosis or lack of lordosis you have in the patient, the more PJK and adjacent level surgeries you'll have. This was one of the earliest publications saying that from Parks Group in Korea uh, in 2007. They said, you know, when we look at our series, the, more, the less lordotic we make the single fusion level for spondylolisthesis, the higher the chances their adjacent level PJK will come. The higher residual pain scores they'll have at one year and two years. So that was very important. So when people say, again, I have this long term, I have myself, Kevin Foley, Jim Schwender, a couple of the guys, we have the longest MIST lift series in the world because we've been doing it since 2000. And when we look at that and compare what our outcomes for it, there's this there's some benefits and there's some negatives of expandables in our early series. One is we are getting better lordotic corrections. You can see those numbers right there. As opposed to like 6.7, we're getting 10.8, 9.5, much better. Subsidence though, with over aggressive expansion is an issue. So what I would say to you is with these te new technologies, it's just so exciting to crank it up and make it big. Problem is it's gonna chew through the end plates of a lot of our older patients. So that you have to temper your enthusiasm, so to speak. And so you spend more time doing facet osteotomies, getting more kind of angular, rocking back rotation, try not to crank as much, lift up gently, and then we'll get less subsidence. But certainly subsidence early on uh, in three to six months is important. And I think it's very important to differentiate the concept of impaction versus subsidence. When we bang in fixed tall cages, we are impacting. Before the patient fuses, the two vertebral bodies are going bam, bam, bam around the cage. That's impaction. That's like you hitting a hammer. But once the bone bonds to the cage and the, there's not much motion, subsidence is what you're doing in the chair right now. Your butt is subsiding into the chair. It's a static phenomenon. Mobile phenomena are impaction. So these, these, all these data and papers are a little confusing because that's why people say the vast majority of subsidence occurs in the first three, three months. But that's not technically true. The vast majority of impaction occurs in the first three months. The rest is subsidence. And so that's why an important concept. That's why better biologics, earlier fusion, earlier somewhat pseudo rigidity, uh, metal coating, metal end bonding, these are very important considerations when you're trying to compensate and reduce the amount of subsidence, so uh, impaction. So for us now, we've gone to very large, wide metal objects that will get titanium bone end bonding around six to eight weeks, we limit the impaction forces, which are nice, and then also have a wider surface area to get decreased pre point Larry, pressure. Uh, regarding that last, yeah. um, the data, the, the ones that are underlined, are those ones that are statistically significant? Correct. Yes, sir. They're statistically so, so the, significant. So the ODI differences between the T-lift and expandable? Exactly. So why do you think that is? And I think it has, and it's not on the slide, but it has everything to do with the segmental lordosis pelvic tilt correction. And it's not on the slide, but anytime the pelvic tilt really truly changes, those patients' ODI scores statistically P.001 do much better at one year. In other words, if we see the pelvic tilt change, those patients do much better. That's a simple statement, but statistically extremely true in our limited experience. 
So, and that's the concept of, again, making every surgery, every single surgery you do at least a double or a triple, not just shoot for a single, because you'll help your patient, you'll help the next guy who has to do the PJK surgery, so on and so forth. So here's another example of using anterior lateral tech type technologies. A typical degenerative scoli patient had some interspinous fixations before, and here you can see kind of what that looks like. And here is the CT, you can see the coronal bending. And now, even with like lateral type cages, you know, or uh, lateral type uh, peritoneal MIS approaches, these expandable technologies are still oft often very helpful because they allow us to lift, have much bigger surface areas, much bigger grafting surfaces. And in cases where we do a ACR, anterior longitudinal release, we have this very big wide footprint object because for those of you who've done a lot of laterals in your life, you know when we use our original peak 40 millimeter, 19, 18 wide cages, we still got a lot of subsidence, right? And people who are honest about their laterals say, I mean, right, we all get the notch. So devices like this, spreading the surface area, moving as it expands, moving the load bearing into the anterior column under the dense uh, ring hypothesis, these are all things that expandables are helpful because you kind of go in in the middle, but it pushes out to where you want the load to actually be born, and that's particularly helpful. So this is an example of one of the uh, other cage companies and uh, the expandable tech technologies that are implemented. The other thing too is very nice is as you expand the vast majority, there are, there are a lot of companies here today, I'm not gonna give names, but they all have a post-fill technology. Post-filling turns out to be very important because you can fill in and around the cage. It's sort of like rebar, it fills the whole area. Here's a, a video of us getting about 15 cc's of graft after the fact into the inner body space through a large funnel, about 12 to 15 cc's. And you have to think about the biologics you use, they have to be relatively flowable to go through like a five millimeter cannula, but nevertheless, post-filling is, is something that you see us doing here and it's, it's a big part of the, the, this concept. Just like Mike with the Optimish post-fills it and gets it to its final size and it interdigitates and that's a really big part of that expansive type concept. And you can see the post-expansion filling and that's a graphic demonstration of some of the things you can do with many of the systems that are now available out there, that post-filling packing, and you can see the screws going in and so on and so forth. And so there we have there. You can see the corrections and things like that. So large ACR, anterior column release, screw pin fixation, posterior instrumentation, and these are the type of things we're achieving. So a final case, a kind of a typical, again, spondy case, and you can see the type of technologies, again, you cannot get around or cheat, you still have to do some type of Schwab osteotomies, determine if the uh, concept is fixed or not. ACR, finally, in conjunction with expandable cages, is a way of achieving great correction instead of doing PSOs for non-rigid segmental corrections. And this is an example of when you have a, when you do an anterior longitudinal ligament, how you can lift it up. And also, to Mike's point, workflow. We do front back surgeries, and even in a lateral position, we now do single stage, right? We put the pedicle screws in the lateral position, we put the a lateral cage in, all in a single stage with image guidance and things like that. So that's kind of what it, the setup looks like. You kind of have the, a, the OLIF or the ALIF retractor on one side, and then you have your pedicle screws and another dude standing on the back side of the patient. And then for like a high-grade spot, this is a high-grade spot right here. You can see we're putting in uh, screws in from the back to control the spine. There's the spot on the table, as you can see. And then simultaneously, now we're accessing a, a, with using image guidance the lateral aspect of the case. You can see it's one team's doing the lateral, the other team's powering in the screws, and then we release the anterior longitudinal ligament to get the correction, because this is a very collapsed body. And then we use the expandable trials, and we use the expandable technologies in conjunction simultaneously with the reduction power of the screws. So you lift a little bit, cut the ALL, cut the ossifites, lift the bones a little bit, reduce the screws a little bit, lift the bones a little bit, reduce the screws a little bit. And then you can see with these new implants, it's essentially a car jack. It's like the one you crank your Mercedes up with when you change the tires. Same basic mechanisms, but just miniaturized. And we're able to achieve 400, 500 Newton lifting power, uh, 500 pounds, 250 Newton lifting powers. So you're able to lift spondies back into their proper height. And that's a very key statement because as opposed to the old days where we'd pound in some type of wedge to lift it up, now you're not pounding to lift, you're actually inserting small and then lifting, right? So that's why subsidence in laterals, for example, goes down quite a bit with this ability to lift up. And so here you can see us, the workflow, we're lifting with the car jack. We're, you can't see it, but we're using the screw threads to reduce the screws and pull it back. And there it is as we're going kind of progressively enlarging. And here you can see we fully, this is all done in a single phase. We fully reduced the grade two spondy, brought it up 18, 19 degrees to a final height anterior of about 19, 20 millimeters. That's all done in a single phase over about 15 minutes. We're running constantly 
opposite mode of rogue potentials to make sure that nothing gets stretched and nothing gets closed. But remember the principle, as you lift the front, you have to close the back. So we are also compressing across the screws at this point in time. And that's how we achieve segmental corrections rapidly. Huh? What have you done with that? We've taken them both, David. We took them both. Because this is a posterior approach and like, even though you just see us putting screws in the back, we do these like kind of down and dirty SAP osteotomies, IAP osteotomies, if you will, and then we'll come back and clean up, of course, afterwards. But in terms of the correction, we'd like to have anterior and posterior control. But like I said earlier, you can never cheat. You always have to do a, some type of Schwab posterior facet osteotomy, whatever that, whatever you want to call it, Pontes, PSO, Smith Peets. Yeah, so we put it in right about the time we put it in screws. The jam sheet is going in, the wires going in, because that literally, then we slide a retractor kind of right over those, and we're looking at them, right? A tube, right, and then you go bam, bam, take the bone, and that's, for example, where we get the bone for the front, right? So we grind that up, take some crest, stick that in the front of the cage. So, exactly right. So, Dr. Polly is right. You can never cheat. We can just optimize, improve workflow, better technology. So there it is in the final construct. Again, like if I didn't tell you how we did the screw, you wouldn't think much about it, right? You'd be like, oh, he did an anterior posterior. But the beauty is we can get reasonable corrections, good looking things through less invasive approaches and optimizing every step of the workflow, like Michael was saying, Dr. Wang was saying about that. And there's the final correction in the lower dot. This actually may be too much lordosis. We'll wait, we'll have to wait and see. But, um, you know, because the question is, okay, yeah, we can do this now with all this cool technology, but how much is too much? And this guy may be actually a little hyper, hyper lordotic, so we're not clear, but this is what his, his one-year follow-up looks like. And you can see, again, pelvic tilt really changed. It changed quite a bit. Lumbar lordosis changed quite a bit. Global lumbar lordosis didn't change that much, but the pelvic tilt really changed. And that's how his ODI really, in our mind, dropped to a very reasonable level, and he was able to return to work. So that's our hyperlodotic ACR series to date. Uh, we actually have a few more, but these are the ones we've been, uh, we just sent off for publications, 54 of these. And like the complications you see, those complications are really the complications of laterals in general, but you can see there's nothing unique to, and there's the cor uh, lordotic correction, and there's that pelvic tilt that Jeff was asking about. We, I've kind of broken it down. You can see the average pelvic tilt change is 10.5 at the beginning from these hyperlodotic LF lateral kind of uh, constructs, and then you can see we lose, uh, it actually improves crazily over time. So this is Beruzek Barnia's kind of global summary of the concept of using ACRs in hyperlordotic or expandable cages in some of them, and on average they're getting a 19 degree increase in intradiscal angle over the 10 paper, over the 12 papers that are included in Beruzek's studies. And again, just like everything else, if you overcorrect, there are complications that are unique to that particular uh, hip flexion weakness, uh, thigh paresthesias, which aren't technically so as palsies because they were just making them so tall and so lordotic that you're actually just stretching the front of their body. And that's a unique thing that Bruce and a lot of people are reporting. And we certainly have seen our share of those as well. Finally, uh, if you look at the anterior column of realignment, uh, uh, you can see a paper here has very similar results when Bruce uh, and the SSG, ISSG groups published. They say that overall in non-rigid deformities, when you have the ability to access one or two disc spaces, the overall uh, uh, pelvic tilt and uh, uh, sagittal balance parameters were very similar in terms of the corrective ability with, as you would expect, significantly reduced overall global complication rates because PSOs, even in the master's hands, is still a bloody difficult operation that takes quite a while. So whenever possible, we look for open, non-rigid spaces to do these corrections for in longer constructs as well. So in, in, in summary, if you look at anterior column resection with laterals and hyperlordotic cages, now with these expandable technologies to decrease subsidence, decrease impaction forces, we are able to do pretty significant corrections. In other words, we can take, like, for those of you who have been doing lateral for a while, a lot of the early cages we used to use, they look they were very tall, but they're kind of flat, right? Like, I mean, let's just be honest, right? I had a lot of wonderful X lifts, L lifts that were kind of tall and flat. <laughs> they just, we weren't that good at it. Just like Dave Pauly said, we, we felt so good about getting the lateral cage. You're like, woohoo, this guy looks great. And then a year later, like, dude, that dude's flat as a pancake, you know? But these are the ways we begin to refine our understanding of these approaches and to get better outcomes. And then again, in our hands, the SRS's databases and some of the papers I've shown you, we know there's a statistically uh, non-significant correlation between, Lord, uh, actually should say, uh, non-significant overall outcomes, but in the lateral study, it's very statistically significant for us. 
And so you can see basically now with these technologies, with the steps, with the image guide technologies, all these moving parts, we can truly change. Uh, we can definitely do what we can do in the open operation. It requires you to understand the workflow, but we're not shortchanging our patients. And in some ways now there's a suggestion, like Mike was saying, in terms of outcomes, awake anesthesia, shorter length of stay, better long-term outcomes. These approaches and these technologies may actually be benefiting our patients to optimize segmental correction and therefore short, midterm, and long-term outcomes. Thank you. Great, thanks, Larry. Um, questions from the audience. How many people are using expandable cages? Um, for those of the surgeons that are using expandable cages, if you if you started using expandable cages, do you ever go back to static cages at all? No. Okay. That's what I've seen actually, you know, like, and all honestly, I've, I was a late adopter to, I'd say yeah. relatively late yeah. to expandable cages. Yeah. But I, I would say that um, once you actually start using expandable cages and see that sort of the advantages of ex using expandable yeah. cages, you probably don't go back to static cages yeah. hardly ever, right Larry? I, and I think the reason a lot of people went back to, to non-expandables was that subsidence issue that I showed. A lot of my colleagues who were kind of that first adopter group, they all went back to, many of them went back to static because they saw a lot more um, uh, subsidence, and also the cost issues are significant. These cages are two to three times more expensive than a fixed plastic or a fixed piece of bone, you know, so to speak. But I think there's a variety of reasons. But I myself, when possible, try to. But yeah, Dave. So, Dave, would you would you mind pressing? There's a there's a microphone. You have to press the the button in the front. Got it. Okay. So um, I have a revision practice. I think to get into my clinic, you have to have had three or four surgeries done badly, That's or, awesome. or that they didn't turn out well. I want to um, be you. Yeah. <laughs> right. No. So so one of the challenges for me is I never want to put something in that I don't they know how to take, take out. out. So true. So tell me yes. uh, on those three four percent of patients who don't heal well with an expandable cage, how do you revise them? I have two words to say for you, Dave Polly: artificial disc, baby. Because it's as hard as taking out an artificial disc. Yeah. Especially those lateral expandables. I've had the pleasure of taking out a few of those now. Yeah, it is a total suck ass, horrible experience. And the expandable T list trying to take you out from the back, I don't. So what I've humbly learned, David, is if I have to go back on like some some of the expandables, I, I'll just get my vascular surgeon. We'll come back and do an a lift approach, take it out. Because the simple answer is when they're expanded up to like a height of like 13 or 11 even from the back, and they're shaped like this, there's no way you're getting it out. There's no way. <laughs> Not without traumatizing a lot of nerve roots along the way. Yeah, so we've had some where they've settled so bad that we ended up having to do PSO to get the sagittal alignment done. Totally. And, and yeah. with a PSO, you can get the cage out. But short of a PSO, um, yeah. it's it's a real bear. Yeah, that's why we've, we've, I, we've just said, screw it. We've gone back. Like I said, it's a lot of the artificial disc kind of thought process technologies. We've gone to straight A-lifts, laterals, you know, anything to not have to go through that. But that slide I showed, and that's a very salient slide, that initial large subsidence, Dr. Pauly is absolutely right because if you do too much with it, it subsides like crazy, especially in an older, softer patient. Basically, it's like it almost looks like a like a dovetail graft at some point. It's so impacted that you have to go through half the vertebral body just to get it out. And so, like Dr. Polly said, is you're basically doing like a Schwab five osteotomy at that point. It's almost more like even not a PSO, but it's almost like a partial VCR, right, at that point in time. And so, you have to really think about that. And so, like I said, none of the rules of orthopedic and neurosurgical spine surgery disappear with the new technologies. In fact, I think you. You have to be particularly more vigilant in an effort to reduce your chance of pseudoarthrosis. And in a very soft bone, think about something else, you know. And, and I would compliment you on your bone graft comment and that uh, there's pretty good data that you got to get 30% cross-sectional area of the disc to heal. Totally. To, yeah. to, and, and if you only cover 30%, it's not all going to heal. Yeah, it, especially if it's a plastic cage, right? I mean, you know. It's not, it's not magic. Yeah, and so, so I think that the, the biggest revision strategy that I have to deal with is people who did a trephin discectomy <laughs> on their T-lift unilaterally and didn't really clean out the disc. Yeah, absolutely, and that, as you know, so much, David, a function of BAP. You know, over a decade, we all became, a lot of us became those kind of surgeons, you know, because of BMP magic, so to speak, and, well, you know. I like Harry Potter, but there's really not much magic in the real world. Do any of the surgeons um, use peak 
static peak cages anymore? You, Dave? Um, of the surgeons that have used P static peak cages in the past, have you ever um, experienced retropulsion of the cage? Oh, yeah. Or migration? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Hands. How many people have seen that? Okay. So I think one of the one thing that I've been really interested in is like so the expandable cages, right? So you you make your annulotomy and you put in a static cage like a P cage that, that doesn't have a lot of like surface oh, yeah. area. Yeah, yeah. It just pops out like a you know like a seed within a within a orange when you try to squeeze it out, right? And I've seen that before, you know. So I've revised maybe like at least th you know three or four cases like that. Yeah. For expandable cages, I mean, it, the, the interesting thing about the technology is that walk when you put it in there, the, so you, have, you have an annulotomy and it expands out, right? Yeah. And just like you guys were saying, it's impossible to take out, right? But it's almost impossible for it to actually retropulse. Yeah, that doesn't happen. They subside, but they don't, they rarely walk backwards. So then what, what are your thoughts on like standalone cages that are stable? Are you really going to make me answer that up here? What do you want your batting average to be? <laughs> exactly. Well, well like, Talking about batting average, the best thing in the world is to do one case, never operate again. You have a thousand, you know, you have a thousand batting average, right? But the truth is, I think that the less you do, sometimes the more you pay. You know, and I think that that because then we keep Dr. Pauly really busy, right? So I think that like doing an endoscopic standalone cage, which is it, it, for like a simple degenerative, there's nothing really going on but the rent type of cage is probably going to be fine. But I think when you start to do correction of any type, pedicle screws, again, remember when we lift the vertebral bodies up, we're going to also lift and uncouple the facets, right? So technically, if the facets are still moving, you're going to make it a little less stable dorsally. So I think you always have to kind of keep that in mind. If it's a very stiff segment and you put in a cage or like an inner body minimally invasive endoscopic graft, I think it'll do just fine. And, you know, for myself, I always, in the back of my head, I'm wondering, do it, does that patient even really need a fusion, right? But, you know, whatever, I'm there. I think, it's, I think it's based on the stability. Exactly. Like, that's, like, like, in yeah, all honesty, I, I would never consider doing, like, a standalone T-lift peak cage. I just wouldn't do it, yeah. you know, because it's yeah. going to pop out. It's yeah. not going to heal, right? But some of the, but the laterals. Larger, some like, of the new larger metal the, ones. The la la even standalone perhaps, laterals. Perhaps so. In, in, in segments that are not inherently unstable. Yes, sir. They, they heal great, actually, and it's yeah. a great procedure, you know? Yeah, and, and, and the, we get the bone, titanium, end bonding, all that kind of stuff. It's great. But yeah, for myself, I struggle to this day uh, humbly to you that I still have a, we have flexion extension x-rays, we have an MRI, we have a CT scan. We have not awesome ways of actually determining the segmental stability of any part of the spine, unless it's a gross trauma where you clearly see it moving. I still to this day have a hard time kind of, I can tell the really stiff ones and I can tell the really hypermobile segments, right? It's the tweeners I still sometimes guess wrong on. And that's, uh, that's my own, you know, my own personal journey that I'm still struggling with because our ability to diagnose to your point segmental stability and the degree of or lack thereof is still poor. And that's why we looked at standing dynamic MRI studies for that kind of stuff. We now look at spec CTs for inflammatory markers and things. But I think our ability to understand the segmental stiffness or stability of a spine is still quite poor, which leads us to make some wrong guesses along the way, you know? And bone quality too as well, of course. Any other questions? Look. I, I'm sorry, I don't have much experience with, with expandable cages, but then are you saying if I understand you correctly, that for an L45 spondy, you think that you can just do an endoscopic expandable cage um, from the back and get enough stability, and that's it, no screws? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm gonna give I'm that gonna... a big hell no. Okay, <laughs> a big, no, no, yeah, so, a little, let... don't, don't go do that, dude. You're, you're, you've, you've got 102 batting average right now, right? No, so don't, let, let me don't, classify don't, this, don't though. Do that, Wait, dude. let me just that's, classify this, because that's, that's a really in interesting stupid. point, you know? <laughs> Because I, I personally think that it's based on the stability of the implant, yeah. right? Like if you have an in inherently stable implant that leads to an inherently in stable segment, I think you could do that, right? So currently at this point in time, I think the cage technology, we're not there yet. Not yet. But, but take, a, take a look at the, the bag of bones, right? Inherently, is that stable? I mean, and, and the techniques that we do for MIS surgery where we impact the intervertebral, intervertebral disc space with bone, it makes it inherently stable, right? Bean Even bag. if we just fill it with just bone. Bean bag. You know, bean bag. It's like bean a bean bag. bag. Like when, when people have floods, what do they do? They bring in bags of sandbags and they put it down in it. It's impenetrable, right? So it's similar to that. So I think that my personal opinion is this. Like I, I believe that, that expandable cases right now, it started off with this. It was a car jack. 
right? When you, when you jack up the car, it, is it inherently stable? Do, when we used to, I used to change my own oil when I was growing up, right? I, when, when the car was jacked up, I would always fear that the car, the jack was going to fall apart and the, the car was yeah. going to come on my face, right? And I think that as we get into more advanced type of expandable cages that have more stability, I do believe that they, at some point that we will be able to do some standalone expandable cages. Because yeah. in reality, I think it's the screws that, that's causing the most of the pain, even for like inpatient or outpatient cases. Like, cause we all know when, yeah. when you do a standalone cage, like the lateral cage, patients are like, they have no pain, very little pain. It's sore right on the incision site. But when you introduce the pedicle screws, they're very painful. It's really difficult to get that 50% of that other population. It's really hard to get yes. those patients home the same day, you know? But that's why I think like as an outpatient procedure, what you just mentioned right there, endoscopic discectomy, you know those patients where you do, they have a massive disc herniation, you do a, you do a discectomy and they're like, ah, I just wish I could fill the space with something, right? Exactly. And jack it up. I think that's what's gonna, yeah. I think that's where the role is going to be when you have those massive disc herniations. It's interesting because once, if, if that's the gap in technology, creating a stable, expandable cage that you can put in endoscopically, yep. at that point, the treatment of a spondy is a pain management procedure. Yeah, and then it again, doesn't require a surgeon. Again, there's that low-grade spondy that's kind of there versus like, you know, a grade two lytic fracture spondy, no, right? So again, diagnostics, for example, the, you know, it's funny you said that car jack analogy. You know, we had a series of earthquakes in, in, in Southern California recently that you heard about with all the aftershocks. Only one person died. Did you know that? And the person was working on his car. They found him crushed under his car. The car, <laughs> the car jack had kicked out. <laughs> that, what an unlucky bastard, right? He happened. It was he's working on his truck. He had the car jacked up, and they found him a day later crushed under the truck. Oh it's the only person, only recorded death from this recent series of earthquakes in Southern California. So, so there so, you go. You know what, Alok, Alok you, you brought up a really good point because Dean and I were just talking about this yesterday, right? Like endoscopic technologies and things that you think that we're, as surgeons, we just kind of tend to poo-poo. Well, the same thing happened with like the cardiac surgeons, yeah. right? Same thing happened with the, the cranial surgeons doing endovascular work, right? So if we don't do it, th these type of minimally invasive, like needle-based procedures, someone else is going to do it. Absolutely. Right. Right. It's just transfemoral epidural steroid injections, th the exact same approach as a T lift. Do you know what I'm saying? So I think that as these these technologies advance, we have to actually take control of those type of procedures.